I desperately want to take revenge on the other woman, get her fired or deported, tell her elderly parents, should I? No, you shouldn't. Um, you know, her, her punishment is being her. Her punishment is winning the wonderfulness that is your ex. Um, her life is punishment enough. So your job is meh. Your job is to move forward and not dignify that whole drama with being a hypotenuse. You know, don't be in a triangle. Don't act, don't give her kibbles. Don't give her centrality. Just walk away and live your life. Um, you know, tell her elderly parents, what are you going to tell them? You know, they know she sucks. You really think you're going to convince elderly people that she sucks? You know, they either know she sucks or, or they're, they're pained by how much she sucks. So I, I don't think there's, they can't take her out to the woodshed. There's nothing they can do, right? They're elderly. So there's no point. Um, get her deported. Okay, then she's some other in country's problem. Um, no, I mean, again, I, I would just say, I know that that would feel good in the moment, but the best thing to do is conserve your energies for your new life and move forward. I really do believe in karma. I really do believe these things have a way of working themselves out, and her punishment is being her. My husband ended his three-year affair, and the married other woman vindictively out of him with anonymous photos. Why shouldn't I destroy her consequence-free home, life, and job? Um, okay, well, I guess the first issue is this guy is still your husband, right? Um, and that mean, mean married other woman did this mean, mean thing to your husband. First of all, the mean, mean person here is your husband. She, look, she sucks. I, I'm, I'm not going to defend her. She absolutely sucks, and she's a freak, right? But you're still married to this guy. That's problem number one. Um, and, and maybe you're a unicorn, and maybe you're reconciling, and it's all going to work out, but that, that's your first problem, okay? Um, so that's a consequence. Him being out is a consequence of his affair. That's no reflection on you. Um, re revenge, you know, destroying her consequence, her, her home life, or whatever it is. Um, I, I don't do, don't go there. Do, if she has a boyfriend or a partner, do let him know just as a fellow chump that he should, he deserves to know. I, I think that is always the kindness when there's an affair going on that you would want to know, do unto others. Um, but in terms of like, no, 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 no more drama. They love the drama. You know, cheaters get off on that. And then she thinks your husband's some great big prize. He's not a prize. He's a cheater. You don't want him, right? He sucks. So that, that's your problem. She's crazy. Hi there. I'm answering my first question here. Um, while obviously older children want to continue their relationship with a cheating parent, this can feel like betrayal. How to accept this? Well, you have to accept it. That's one of the shit sandwiches of being a chump. Um, sorry to put it bluntly. Um, Children loving parents is really primal. It's really basic, and your kids have a right to love the other parent. Um, and, and you have a right to not have that person in your life. <laughs> so you're kind of at a crossroads there. Um, it's one of those things where you really have to empathize. I mean, imagine how you felt, what your views were about infidelity and betrayal before it happened to you. You know, I'm sure you had a friend or you knew someone that it's happened to. And, and you didn't have the perspective that you have now since it happened to you. Um, you can't expect your kids to have that perspective. And they have a really vested interest in not getting it because it's their parent. Um, and it's unfair to make them take sides. But the take heart here, I'm not, I'm not trying to like, you know, take total neutrality. Your job is to be the same parent. Your job is to parent with your values and keep being you and, and keep doing that hard job. Um, and kids eventually figure it out. And, and, and I really believe that people who are crappy continue to be crappy. Their character continues to be that and they keep continuing to make lousy choices and selfish choices. And oftentimes that means being a lousy parent. Um, and it's really hard to watch, especially when those actions hurt your child. 
but you, you kind of have to stand back and let your kids figure that relationship out for themselves. And, and like I said, you know, it's perspective. Children, I don't know how old your kids are, but they don't have the years, uh, you know, invested. They don't know what it's like to build a life with somebody, to commit to somebody, to have a mortgage, to have children, to have shared history. They don't have that life perspective, and it's not fair to expect them to have it. So you just got to kind of trust that they suck, trust that you don't suck, trust that you know what the truth is, and don't try to defend yourself. Just keep being the same parent. Hang in there. I know it's a really tough one. That's why that one went to the top of the questions. Okay, thanks. Hi again. What are the best tips to move past the fury and rage a cheater's betrayal creates? Um, I guess my first point would be, why do you want to move past it? You know, rage and fury are telling you something. They're telling you that your situation is dangerous and fraught and hurting you. And, you know, think of it as your internal warning system that, you need to get the hell out of there um, and start protecting yourself. And, you know, it's a big red sign that something's wrong. That's, that's why you feel rage about it, you know, um, because it's unjust, because it's threatening you. Um, so, you know, there, there's a lot of discourse to immediately forgive and be understanding and take the high road and, you know, all that's very good, but, when it's happening to you, no. The number one thing is to protect yourself and to channel your anger and to use it productively um, and, and to accept it and, and to feel it because it, it's finite, it goes away, but it's an, in my opinion, it's necessary. And, and that rageful self is, is trying to protect you from an injury. Um, now that said, don't do something stupid. Don't get yourself in jail. Don't commit acts of revenge. Like I said, channel it. Call a lawyer, protect yourself, line your ducks up, get your finances in a row, collect your evidence, protect your emotional well-being, go no contact, surround yourself with support. There's lots of things you can do with that anger. Um, the funny thing about anger is, is that when you acknowledge it, when you, when you allow yourself to be really mad about an unjust and hurtful situation, you move past it. When other people validate you and say that was horrible and, and you didn't deserve it and you can share that on a board like Chump Lady or other places, it, it dissipates. It, it, you can let go a lot quicker. You can move on. And I would say the other thing, you know, if it's years later and you're still mad about it, then I would say you've got more work to do on building that new life. And, you know, if you're co-parenting, it's hard. You're still, like, in touch with this person. Um, you know, meh, as I call it, takes a bit longer to accomplish. But, you know, you can do it. It, it just, it's really about letting the new life eclipse the old life and investing in yourself and investing in that new life um, and, and going no contact with as much as possible, if you can, with the other person. Um, you really will get to the other side. But rage and fury is totally normal in the beginning. It's, it's totally natural and it's absolutely the right human response to injustice in my feeling my opinion as a jump thanks why do you think that the notions of affairs being sexy and reconciliation dominate the infidelity narrative um well those are two really different questions but the first one why are affairs sexy um i, I think because doing anything taboo um is you know, is edgy, right? The devil has all the best lines. It's it's transgressive, and so yeah, it's attention getting. Um, that's a much probably more interesting, dramatic arc than they really loved each other and were committed to each other and grew old together. Um, so you know, sexy, dangerous, living on the edge, all of that. Um, yeah, and I'm sure if you can be high on, on narcissism and entitlement and centrality and you can suppress your empathy for your partner, you know, maybe it feels great. Maybe you feel really super, super sexy because, you know, everybody wants to. Um, so, so, yeah, I understand why that, that makes an interesting drama, right? Um, that's a different question than why does reconciliation dominate the infidelity era? 
Uh, reconciliation, I think, dominates the infidelity narrative because when it happens to you, that's usually your first impulse. Um, your first impulse is usually disbelief and and pain and, and and a beautiful thing, which is putting your pain aside to in humility and, and in grief to, to try to preserve that which you thought you had. Um, that that's not not a bad impulse. Um, it can be a very self-destructive impulse. You can get played for having that impulse, which is what I try to warn people about. Um, but I don't think it's a bad impulse. Um, however, as I said before, I, I think cheating is based on entitlement, and it's really hard for cheaters to give up that entitlement and, and be able to reconcile from, from an authentic place. Um, I think the other reason it dominates the narrative is it's, you know, Control. You know, we feel like we can control this very painful outcome, and and it doesn't make us feel so vulnerable, and it's very scary to think about starting over. So I think that's why reconciliation is the preferred story. Hi, again. In your opinion, why do we chumps have such a hard time accepting the reality of our situation, even in cases of extreme narcissism and abuse? Well, the reality really sucks. It's it's hard to accept it. You know, denial. You know, why don't we accept a lot of really ugly realities? Why don't we accept climate change or the gun problem or, you know, any number of ugly things? Um, when we're really, really close to an ugly reality, it's even harder to accept it because we're deeply invested in it not being true. We've got major sunk costs. So, so yeah, you stay sunk. You stay sunk in your sunk costs and you stay stuck. Um, but the sooner you accept the reality, the quicker you can move on to protecting yourself, and it, it's really important to to get real with yourself. Um, I would say the other big reason why people don't deal with the reality that they've been chumped and, and that they're with, with an abusive partner is the sense of self-control. You know, if you think that you brought it on and you think that you can fix it, then you don't feel so vulnerable. Then you feel like you have power, and power is a very seductive you know, commodity when you've been chumped, when you feel vulnerable and you've been abused, you would do most anything to not feel that way. And and so it's kind of a paradox, isn't it? Because the one way you could stop feeling that way is to get real about your situation and get away from it. Um, but a lot of us, you know, codependent, chumpy people, um, we stick around and take the blame and think we can fix it when it's not really our thing to fix and we didn't cause it to happen. So, so yeah, reality, reality is hard, you know, um, it's getting real with yourself and that that's the painful solution. How do you best support your young adult children when they realize that dad doesn't really want to have anything to do with them? Hmm, that's a tough one. You know, you're not responsible for their dad not wanting anything to do with them. All you can do is tell them that you're there for them, you have their back, and you live their ba those values, that, that you're the parent who cares, that you're the parent who shows up. And, you know, there isn't any magic thing that you can say to someone who's been abandoned. You, there's only things you can do, just show up, do your job. Um, you're not responsible for making excuses for him or explaining it. Because it, it's inexplicable. How, how do you explain someone like that? Um, you know, there, there's nothing to say. It, it, everything is being demonstrated. Um, and you, your children are not stupid, and they will figure that out. Um, I know it's, it's so hurtful as a parent to see your child be hurt, but, you know, that's where you find the mama bear inside you and the grizzly, and you protect your kids, and you just bring... You bring your aching. You know, you gotta you gotta make up for what a an idiot he is. Um, you know, it sounds like a burden, but really, there's a lot of blessings in getting to parent your kids without interference from someone like this, and getting to parent them according to your values, um, with without this idiot. Um, you know, there's no tug of war. It's you get them, and aren't you uh, the lucky one? Now that we are headed for court, he's become father of the year. 
how do I deal with this anger without looking like the deranged ex? Um, oh, I, this is a temporary problem. How long do you think he can keep that up? You know, <laughs> like, and, and if he can, you know, if, if he can pay for Disney trips and, you know, new sparkly things, let him. You know, you don't control his parenting. You don't control him being father of the year. You don't control, you know, how he's perceived or anything. You just control you. And as I keep saying, be the same parent. Be the parent. Be the parent who parents. Be the parent who, you know, gets book reports done. Um, you know, who tells them, no, you can't have 15 chocolate bars for dinner. You know, whatever it is, be the parent. Love your child, model your values, be resilient, have a life you know, all the good things. You're not, it's not a competition, right? It's not a competition. You are now a single parent and you get to parent according to your values. And what he does on his time is his business. And kids figure it out. Take the long view. What do we say to the family reconciliation promoters who try to guilt trip us? The, oh, you didn't try hard enough, you must forgive tribe. Um, <laughs> nobody, look, nobody, says, nobody knows how hard you tried, right? Nobody knows how many books you ordered on Amazon or what you did or what you didn't do or how many hours you spent in the shrink's office. Um, let, me, let me start with forgiveness. Forgiveness is nobody's business but your business. Nobody can demand it of you. Nobody can snap their fingers and make it happen. And, and, and there's no forgiveness card that they're gonna check you and grade you, right? This is your business. You can move on fine and heal up great and never forgive. Or you might come to forgiveness in your own way, in your own time. But you certainly aren't gonna get there in the early days. It's, you know, when you're still processing the offense. And it's a very difficult thing to do to forgive somebody who doesn't think they did anything wrong, right? <laughs> who thinks they just skipped after happiness and, and they're awesome. Um, it's a very challenging thing. Personally, I think forgiveness is meh. I think it's acceptance. I think it's letting go of revenge and, and injustice and getting on with your life. Um, that might not be enough for some reconciliation people who think you have to be friends and go on carnival cruises together and be buddies. I, that to me is a ridiculous standard. Um, you know, you didn't do them harm and you don't really care. That's, that's acceptance. That's, that's the higher plane. That's what we're aiming for. Um, so what do you say to family reconciliation promoters? You don't say anything to them, right? Don't buy their books, don't buy their crap, don't buy their $300 affair, dollar affair proof your marriage programs. Um, uh, yeah, don't communicate. <laughs> like, you don't owe them anything. And you certainly don't owe them your thoughts on forgiveness. What do I say when people ask what happened? I wanna say lying, cheating, et cetera, but that's not the high road. Um, yeah, well, first of all, who are they to you and why do they need to know? You don't have to answer everybody's questions about what's going on in your personal life. That's the first thing I'd say. The other thing is, you know, the high road. <laughs> Define high road. You know, as, as I say, you know, I didn't kill you. For, consider yourself forgiven. You know, if you're not committing violence, if you're maintaining your dignity, if you're co-parenting according to the parenting agreement, you're taking the high road, in my opinion. If you're not insulting them, you're not asking for revenge, you know, you're doing enough. You don't have to invite this person to your birthday party and you don't have to be their best friend and you don't have to make pleasant shit chat with them, you know? So when people ask what happened, they'd be like, they cheated on me and I divorced them. That's what happened. Um, that's your truth. You can absolutely speak it. You shouldn't be ashamed to speak it. And telling the truth is not poison. It's not saying terrible things about it. So it's just factual, right? You know, there are three people, four people, five people, whatever it was in my marriage, and I, I ended it. You know, that's the truth. Um, there's nothing shameful in that, and there's nothing low down or not taking the high road about saying that. But, but people aren't just going to come out and go, like, tell me, you know, watch your marriage end. Tell me all the details. You know, you don't, you don't have to go there. Um, 
and that's why we have infidelity support forms to share all those details with other people who get it. So that's my advice. Do you distinguish the exit affair as different than other type affairs, serial, et cetera, in that it is more understandable or excusable? Um, yeah, I, I think exit affairs are kind of like unicorns. I, I don't think they're terribly, they're terribly common. Um, the weird thing is, is that in the general discourse about infidelity, most people assume that, you know, affairs are exit affairs, i.e. one day you just happen to fall in love with somebody through no fault of your own and you decide that they're a better fit and, and you fall in love and you end it with your partner and you go off into the sunset with that new person. Um, you know, and who can fault love? You know, that, that's like the discourse that's out there. Um, versus what cheating is, which is cake eating. Cheating, cheating is trying to have both, right? You have your chump, you know, your secure source of kibbles, and then you have your exciting, you know, affair partner. And you love the triangle or the rectangle or the dewey decahedron. You, you, love, you love that complicated dynamic. Um, and in my opinion, that's what's common. You know, judging by my mail, judging by 10 million hits on my blog, um, yeah, that's what people are writing into me about, you know, discovering that their partners are serial cheaters that's been going on a lot. That's what I, I do think there are people who just walk away and leave and, and end relationships um, and have overlap. Do I think it's worse? You know, it's hard to get into the pain Olympics. I, I think the less cake eating someone does, the better. Um, the people who have double lives for years, for decades, those people are really messed up. And, and there seems to be a lot of that. Um, and cake eating seems to be the preferred state for cheaters based on my reading of my own blog um, and my reading of other infidelity boards for years. Um, so is it more understandable? I don't know. I, I mean, I don't think there's much to understand about affairs other than they're based on entitlement. So I don't think it's any more or less understandable. I think it's somewhat less pathological and screwed up because you're not um, eating cake and, and keeping that limbo state for so long. So it's probably not a very satisfying answer, but there it is. What helped you realize that living with a cheater was not worth the suffering? What made you wake up and value yourself? Um, what made me realize that the suffering wasn't worth the suffering? The suffering, you know? Um, it, it sucked, it, you know, obviously. If you've lived this, you know that it's really, really painful. Um, I, I would say it's not that I, I woke up one day and valued myself. I think I, I always valued myself. Um, in one weird way of looking at it, I, I might have valued myself a bit too highly. I think I believed in my superpowers, that I could change another person and that I could make him treat me better, you know, or come to his senses or have grand insights. You know, it took me a long time to realize that this person's manipulations were completely intentional and, and calculated and that they were they were decisions that reflected on his character and, and what he wanted. Um, that's a very painful reality to accept. So as I discussed in an earlier question. Um, so, you know, every, everybody has their own threshold of pain, like how much you can take, you know, how many times you want to stick around and get kicked in the teeth. Um, but I said the other thing about, about, dysfunctional bad relationships is, is that every abuser has hooks. You know, if somebody was just lousy and horrible to you all the time, you'd be a fool to stick around, you know? Um, look, heroin has a high, you know? No, nobody shoots up and becomes a junkie because they like the lifestyle. Um, you know, it's the same with cheaters. There's a reason why you probably got involved with this person and there's true affection there and you know, maybe it's a mirage. You, you fell in love with a hologram of who you thought that person was. Um, but most people have hooks. And, and, this, and there is a self-reinforcing kind of thing that when you're feeling vulnerable and this person, you've been traumatized by 
by infidelity. You crave, weirdly, you crave that validation from the very person who hurt you, which is messed up, you know, which you shouldn't do, um, but it's human, right? Um, so I, I would say, yeah, you should absolutely value yourself. You should know your worth. But more than that, you should know your limits, right? You're not a super, you don't have superpowers. I don't have superpowers. We can't make other people behave the way we want them to behave. That's on them. And, and our responsibility is to take care of ourselves, you know? And if someone's not treating you right, get away. When you create a post about a published article, such as Imperfect Beginnings, have the authors ever contacted you to defend their position? Um, no, not really. I mean, I've, I've heard in that particular one, um, the first time I ran it, I heard from the wife, who wasn't heard from in the New York Times article, um, and that was interesting. Uh, I, I have heard from one of the other women that I put through the Universal Bullshit Translator. Um, she was not pleased. But, you know, my feeling is, like, if you're going to write about how awesome it is to, like, have an affair and, you know, cheat with somebody and their unknowing chump is in the dark and you just think it's fantastic, then, then you shouldn't be surprised if someone wants to write about it and go, that's messed up, you know? Why, why be mad at me? I, if you, most of the time, no, they don't want to start with me, um, you know. Maybe they don't Google themselves. I don't know. But, you know, sorry, not a very satisfying answer. You know, I, I don't write for them. I write for chumps. When are you going to do a TED Talk on infidelity? We can't have Esther Perel being the only voice on infidelity. No, we can't. Oh, Esther. I would love to have a cage fight with Esther Perel, but I don't know. Maybe my agent can work that out. Um, Esther Perel, that anybody doesn't know, is the author of Mating in Captivity and is a great cheater apologist. Um, I, so TED Talks, I think you have to be nominated for them. I, I have certainly not promoted myself for one. Um, keep in mind, I don't have a PhD, neither does Esther Perel. Um, I have a useless master's degree in African history, um, and I am a chump. So, so those are my credentials, that and the ability to think critically. So I don't know if I guess you TED Talk or not. Um, so I, honestly, I don't really know what's involved. The way I try to change the discourse is, is with my book, Leave a Cheater, Gain a Life, and my blog, Chump Lady. Um, the blog just flipped to 10 million page views this week. So, you know, it's, it's a pretty strong voice. It's out there. And if you want to nominate me for a TED Talk, I would be honored. You know, thanks. What led you to label infidelity as abuse where others can sometimes romanticize it? Um, what led me to believe it? It's, it's just critical thinking, right? It, it is abuse, right? It's, it's emotional abuse. It's psychological abuse. You can't cheat on somebody without lying to them, um, gaslighting them, denying their reality, telling them what appears to be isn't what it is. Um, you, you have to deceive somebody. You have to make a thousand decisions to deceive someone to carry on a fair for any duration. Um, that is psychologically abusive. Now then, so that, that's one aspect of it. The other aspect of it is if you cheat with somebody, you are making unilateral decisions about your chump's health. Um, you are risking their health and, and in some cases their life, right? You know, HIV, AIDS. People have written to me with really horrible stories, you know, men having to paternity test their children, people losing pregnancies to STDs, um, you know, it, it's, it's serious stuff, and, and that is a physical element of it that I think is greatly underestimated and never talked about in our culture. That this person, you know, took risks with your health, and, and that's not okay, that's not romantic. That's not, you know, eating in captivity and having little exciting things on the side. That's abusive, right? It's abusive. And then the other part of it is that cheating is, is a power trip, right? It's, it's saying, I want you to invest all your resources in me, and I don't have to do that for you, and I'm a very special person, and the rules don't apply to me, and, and I can have a different arrangement because I'm just going to lie to get it. I'm going to gain advantage. That's what disordered people do. 
that's what bad people do. That's what abusers do, right? They act from a place of superiority. Um, so I just think it's a common sense argument. Um, if you can get your sexual jollies and feel romantic while you're abusing a chump, that's on you, right? You don't have empathy. You're narcissistic. Um, you know, I can't tell you what's romantic and what's not. Some people think that's romantic. I don't think it's romantic. As a former betrayed spouse, do you constantly wonder if your current partner will cheat? No, no, we don't. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, that's no way to go through life. Um, first of all, I, I think that constantly wondering if they're going to cheat is something that happens when you reconcile with somebody who's cheating on you. Um, if you're going to start over and remarry, as I did, you owe it to your new partner to trust them and, and love them and feel secure with them. And I would never have married my husband if I didn't feel totally secure with him. Um, now, that's not to be smug, right? Nobody knows, right? But here, here's the difference. I'm different. I'm more resilient. I don't put up with crap. I have boundaries. I'm not a chump anymore. So it, that's the first thing. I trust myself. As for trusting him, my husband was a chump. He was once married to a serial cheater. Um, he's been through it. He gets it. He knows it. Uh, you know, I have a lot of worries, you know, one of us getting sick and dying before our time, you know, not having enough time with him. That worries me. Um, you know, <laughs> cheating, no. Hopefully that's one awful thing we don't have to ever relive, either one of us. Um, there are other nightmares, but pray to God that one's not in my future. Um, but nope, I don't worry. He's a good guy. Do you know of any one mistake cheaters who wholeheartedly regret their infidelity and have shown that they are committed to not doing so again? Um, do I know any personally? No, I, I mean, I don't. But that doesn't to say I don't believe in them. I, I mean, I, I know I use the term unicorn. I do believe that you know, unicorns exist, but they're really rare, right? They're a mythical forest creature. Um, and I, I mean, I do know a guy who's been married seven times, who's a serial cheater, um, who, you know, is, is six, you know, he's, he's got it together now, as far as I know. Um, you know, he just openly admits, I was an asshole. It didn't really have anything to do with who, you know, with my partner at the time. I just wanted to cheat, so I did. You know, he's really refreshingly honest about it. I, I do know people like that. Um, I don't even know. I couldn't even tell you if he regrets it. But, um, but I, I do like his honesty. Uh, you know, the whole one mistake cheater, it, it's hard to know. And, and here, here's why I think it's unlikely, okay? Um, I don't think it's impossible, I, but I think it's unlikely. I, I, I think it's it's less likely within the relationship with which they cheated in. I think that, that relationship's over. Can they move on and, and, you know, develop their character and not do it again? Yeah, I, I believe in that. Um, but to have an affair means you have pretty crappy coping skills, you have bad impulse control, um, and there's, a, to my way of thinking, a high degree of narcissism is based on entitlement to, to be able to suppress your empathy enough for your partner to go out and cheat on them. And if you can suppress your empathy to go out and cheat on somebody, that feels really great, right? Entitlement feels awesome, you know, king of the world, queen of the world. Um, humility and shame and grappling with what you did and wholehearted regret, that doesn't feel so great. But it's harder to, to go there. It's harder to feel there. And most people don't come out of the starting gate after having an affair from a position of humility. They, they come at it from a position of entitlement and being high on kibbles. So I don't think it's a quick transformation. I think changing your character is painful and and it's something that happens over time, over a long time. And, and if you've been chumped, it's up to you to, to decide if you really want to invest in that journey. It was somebody who's demonstrated that, that they prefer entitlement. So good luck. Hard question to answer, sorry, but how does one get to the state of meh when one has been inflicted with an SDE from the cheater? My blood still boils. And it sucks that, you know, antibiotics, antiretrovirals, I, I don't know what STD you got. I'm sorry, it's unfair. Um, 
that's one of the reasons why I think infidelity is abusive. It risks your health. It takes risks that you did not sign up for um, and that we're not okay with you. Uh, you know, it's not a pain Olympics. You know, there's, there's lots of other horrible things that we live with after, you know, we've been cheated on. <laughs> you know, some people lose half the time with their kids, you know, tens of thousands of dollars. In your case, your parting gift was, you know, an STD. Um, you know, yeah, you're going to be angry because it's unjust and it's unfair and, and you didn't sign up for that. Um, it's just another, as I call them, shit sandwich. One of those things you just have to accept um, about the unjustness of the situation. Um, you know, but it, it's another occasion to practice self-care and take good care of yourself and self-care and, you know, realize that he, he can you know, give you a disease, but he can't take your soul. He can't change who you are. It's just, it's just a rotten reminder. And I'm sorry, it's really unfair, and you didn't deserve that. Does having to analyze cheaters daily ever depress you? Uh, sure, yeah, sometimes it's really depressing. Um, but what depresses me more is the advice out there. Most of the advice, 99.9% .9 of it sucks. And if there were 100 other sites like Chump Lady telling people to protect themselves and that champion self-respect and telling you that you didn't have to take it and that wasn't your fault and that there's a better life on the other side, if there were more sites like that, I wouldn't do it. Um, I do it because I think the other advice is crap. And, and nature pours a vacuum. And, you know, if you don't have any other part of the narrative, then that, that's the winning narrative. Um, so, yeah, cheaters depress me, but the people who tell you to um, reconcile with them and that you're a failure if you divorce them um, and Jesus hates divorce and, you know, all those voices, they depress me more. Um, and I'll also say the other thing about my site it, that is not depressing is that people are really resilient. Chumps are incredible. They're mighty. You know, I have the tell me how you're mighty parts of, you know, chump lady. Um, and those stories knock me out. You know, yeah, there's a lot of hurt and there's a lot of bad things and bad characters in the world. And there's also a lot of really strong, beautiful, amazing people overcoming it. And that's why I tune in and that's why I keep doing it. So. On your blog, you recommend deposing the fair partner in some cases. How can this best be used as an advantage in no-fault states? Um, well, I'm not a lawyer, okay, so I'm not going to give you legal advice. I, I've thrown it out rhetorically and talk to your lawyer about how you can use it in a no-fault state. Um, and do not construe this as legal advice. <laughs> but, you know, when you're being messed around with in the divorce process, and especially if it's a workplace affair, you know, have your lawyer say, oh, I'd like to depose your affair partner and see how quick it makes settlement talks move. Because in the experience of many people on my blog, it gets things moving quite quickly. Hi there, I'm Tracy Shorn, otherwise known as the Chump Lady, and I'm excited to be doing a Doyen live video, Ask Me Anything, on Monday, June 13th at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. I run the popular advice site Chump Lady. And I'm also the author of Leave a Cheater, Gain a Life, The Chump Lady's Survival Guide. Join the discussion and ask me anything like, how do I leave a cheater, Tracy? Or, I got this drunk text, what does it mean? Or, is that your real hair? I will answer anything. So tune in, check it out. I'll answer it live next Monday. Hope to see you then, bye-bye. How do I truly move past caring what my ex thinks of, thinks of me? Um, why would you care what this person thinks of you? You know, consider the source. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, again, it's easy for me to say, but this person is cheating on you, right? You know, they're kind of stupid. They're immoral. They take big risks. Um, they're they're not very smart, right? So uh, they showed terrible judgment. So why would you care what somebody with terrible judgment? We'll just leave it there, okay? No judgment on the morality. 
terrible judgment. <laughs> you know, why would you care what they think of you? I know you care what they think of you because you invested a lot of time in them and you thought they were special and you believed in their star goals and, you know, and it hurts. I, I get it. But you have a trust that they suck problem. You really trust that this person sucks and, and what they did to you was inexcusable and, that, and not your fault and you didn't drive them to it and you didn't make them cheat on you. When you really internalize that, you will not care what they think of you, right? Because what they did is on them and their lousy character. It has nothing to do with who you are. Being divorced is one of my biggest fears of being a failure in marriage. What can I expect leaving my cheater? Um, you can ex if you're leaving a cheater, you can expect a better life. You can... In, or I wouldn't be blogging, I wouldn't be putting that message out there. I, I do think you have a much better life when you champion self-respect and you captain your own ship and you build a new life for yourself. Yeah, I think that's much better than living with the constant devaluing and second-guessing and hyper-vigilance that is living with a cheater. So it's addition by subtraction. Um, being divorced, uh, it's not your failure, right? If you got cheated on, that was your cheater's failure. That wasn't your failure. Um, you didn't do anything to drive that person to do it to you. You might really suck. I don't say that often enough. You might really suck. You didn't make that person cheat on you, right? They had a whole decision tree of therapy and divorce lawyers and honest conversations, and, and they didn't do those things. For whatever reason, you still have value to them, and they wanted to avoid consequences, and so they chose to cheat, and that is an issue of character, right? So this isn't your failure. It's their failure. And you have to reframe it. I mean, I say this a lot. You have to reject divorce shame. You may have gotten divorced because you value marriage, because you believe in sickness and health, and you believe in fidelity, and you believe in growing old together, and you believe in family, and you're divorcing because your partner doesn't share your values. They, that's not how they see love, you know? <laughs> they may have a very different concept of what marriage is, and you're just incom incompatible, right? And that's not a failure. It's not your failure, okay? As long as you are authentic and, and you love with your whole heart and you are honest and you try, you have nothing to be ashamed of. It's not a failure. It's not something that you should carry around and feel bad about. Should I confront my ex and his affair partner on their tendency to treat me like excrement? Why do they act this way? They got what they wanted. Um, well, if they got what they wanted, let them have it and back away. Um, should you confront them? No, you should not confront them. You, confronting them is just playing the hypotenuse. It's, it's, you know, being part of their drama. And they want that, right? They want the centrality. They want to the pick me dance. You know, the pick me dance says, to the cheater, I'm really awesome and I'm being fought over and I've got, you know, these two people who are like going to have a cat fight for me and you don't want to go there, right? Again, you have a trust that they suck problem. If you really trust them that your cheater sucks, then you're not going to fight for the privilege of his attention or what he thinks or what she thinks. And why would you try to convince these people, right? You're behaving in, in this way, like, the Sermon on the Mount, right? They're not going to get it. So remove yourself from the situation. It's good for your mental health, and, and it is the best way to say fuck you to them is your indifference and you're moving on. That's what registers. You, no kibbles, right? No centrality. No narcissistic supply. Just bye-bye. And why do they act this way? Because they want your attention, because it makes it really exciting for them. And it's not very exciting if you're not getting all worked up about it. Hi there, this one says, I am now in mess and dating. The worry about my picker and the fact that I have chump tendencies, what can I do to improve my chance of choosing a good mate? Um, well, work on being a chump. I mean, there's great things about being a chump. You know, you're open, you're trusting, you 
tend to give more than you get. Um, you know, those aren't, not everything's a pathology, not everything's bad. Those can be good qualities, but just, you know, know your value and don't, don't get in lopsided situations. That's probably my number one takeaway from not being a chump. Um, all toxic relationships are really lopsided, unfairly. And cheaters, and what cheating is, is entitlement. And it's saying, I want you to invest all your resources in me, and I'm not going to do the same for you, and I'm going to keep it hidden from you, so I gained advantage. Um, and so while cheaters keep that hidden, and you can be deceived, and that hurts, moving forward, what you want to look for is somebody who is a giver, like you're a giver, somebody who wants and expects reciprocity. So when you do something nice for somebody, you want somebody who can't wait to do something nice back for you. And, you know, and that's not saying everybody goes Dutch on the check or, or something like that, but just that it pleases them to please you. It, 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 that there is an equality, that there's a mutual respect, and that there's a mutual level of interest, that you're never wondering what their motivations are, you don't feel like you need a decoder ring, it's not running hot and cold, that this person is like solid and that their actions line up with their words. That, that's, what, that's generally what, to me, fixing a picker looks like. Um, and you're not making excuses for them. I mean, it's really easy when you really want something to, to make excuses for someone and try to fit it into something that really isn't. Um, so, and that is a chump tendency, a bad one. We call that speckle. So don't speckle and date for character. Take it slow and judge people by their character. And ultimately know that you're resilient. You know, if they true, prove to be a bum, you know, know that you know how to dump them and start over. Why can't he just treat me and the kids fairly in the divorce? Everything is a deal breaker for him. Okay, well, let me ask you this. Did he treat you fairly in the marriage? I mean, he cheated on you, right? So you can expect more of the same. You can expect more of the same entitled, narcissistic, ridiculousness that you tolerated before. Uh, and not only you're not tolerating it, so now he's going to be really mad. And the way he's going to be mad is he's going to punish you for having the temerity to divorce him. Um, you know, even if the divorce is his idea, and this is the crazy thing about cheaters, is usually chumps have to file, right? Um, they want cake, most of them. They, they, they really do, and they're going to leave all the messy and pleasant details of divorce to you. Um, or you're supposed to mediate and just sign all their favorable terms. That's not a good idea. Um, so I guess my advice to you is first, stop expecting that he's going to treat you fairly. He's not. The person whose job it is to get a fair settlement off your soon-to-be ex is your lawyer, and you get the best family law lawyer that you can afford. And even if you can't afford them, you get that person and you take their advice. You are paying them to be your brains, and you are paying them to be analytical because you are too emotional to make good decisions right now. And, and part of your delusion is that you think that this person is going to treat you fairly. They're not. Okay, because they've been acting in an entitled, horrible way by cheating on you. Um, everything's a deal breaker for him because, yeah, consequences suck and adulting is hard. And, yeah, I'm sure he doesn't like it. So, you know, lawyer up. Many therapists recommend not telling children that one parent has cheated. Why do you advocate telling children the truth about infidelity? Um, because I don't think it's okay to gaslight your children, even with the best of intentions. Uh, you know, I don't think it's all right to tell children that we just drifted apart, you know, um, because then children think that love is some nebulous gas and people just mysteriously fall out of love, which instead of the truth, which is that life has deal breakers. And when people hurt you grievous, grievously, um, when bad things happen, there are consequences. And, and even a small child understands that. And then the other thing is, you know, saying your mom cheated on me, your dad cheated on me, or they have this new person in their life, that's just the truth. You know, poison, bad mouthing, alienating children is, you know, mommy's a slut and you can never see her again. That's poison, okay? <laughs> um, just stating the facts, not editorializing, is what I recommend. 
um, and answering your children's questions and and don't try to tell them you don't understand why it happened. You can't explain to your child why it happened. But what you can say is is who you're going to be through this. You know, I have your back. I love you. I'm here. I'm not going anywhere. I have, you know, as I say, be the same parent. That's what your kids want to know. You, you don't know why the other person did it. Um, and as for therapists, I'm not a therapist. I'm a chump. I'm someone who lived it. I'm someone who had to explain it to a kid. And there are therapists who do agree with my point of view on this one. Um, it, it's not a, there isn't, there isn't like one answer on this. But I do feel very strongly that children deserve the truth. And a lot of them probably know the truth before you knew the truth. I see so many chumps on the site go, no contact with great success. Huge struggle failure point for me. Tips. Um, yeah, I don't know which chumps you're talking about. Most people really have difficulty with no contact in the beginning. It is the rare person who gets cheated on and turns on their heel and goes, I'm done with you, you know, goodbye forever. Um, most people are gobsmacked, they're staggered, they're in shock, they're in denial, they're going through all the stages of grief. Um, they don't go with no contact right away. It's not, you know, it's not easy. Um, so, so tips, yeah, it's, um, it's a discipline. It's a discipline. I mean, the mechanics of it are very easy. You know, you block the email or you send it to a filter or you have your lawyer deal with it. Um, you change your address, you block theirs. You know, if you don't have kids together, obviously. Um, the, it's, it's a mental discipline. You have to tell yourself that there is nothing more to be said, that you cannot reason with this person, that you cannot beg them, you cannot chase them. Um, and that they don't have an insight problem, that, that by cheating on you, they're, they're very clear about what they're doing. They, they don't need your insights that, you know, you're broken or really you didn't get it. No, they, they get it. You know, it's you're the person who needs to get it. That, that, yep, they really did devalue you. Yep, that's really what they think. Um, and when you painfully internalize that, you will want to go no contact. You won't want to be hurt anymore. It is that bargaining stage of grief that keeps you engaged. Um, and also, it's just the messed up nature of, of a lot of cheaters and that they, they want the drama and they want the centrality and they want the pick me dance and they want to engage with you. And you have to, you know, have enough dignity to step away from that and not play ball. How do you handle seeing the cheater at events like graduations, weddings, etc.? Well, I'm presuming that the cheater that you're seeing, you'd be seeing them at graduations and weddings, et cetera, because you have children with them. Um, and those are the only two high occasions I can think of where if you have grown children, you would have to interact with them. So the first thing to keep in mind is that these are really rare once in a lifetime events, you know, or maybe, you know, depending on how many degrees you get, um, you know, they don't come around that often. So, so you don't have to, spend a lot of time borrowing trouble, worrying about this stuff. How do you handle seeing them? There's nothing for me. I know it's easy for me to say, right, because I, I'm years past this and, and kind of in that. I still would not want to see either one of my exes in anything. Um, my husband calls this the turd in the punch bowl phenomenon. Like, you don't want to see that turd in your particular punch bowl. But it, things where your kids are involved, you, you can't avoid it, right? And the thing to realize is that, you know, if you loved with your whole heart, if you brought your A-game, if you tried to save your marriage, if you acted your life in integrity and, you know, you have nothing to be embarrassed about, I, they should be far more upset and frightened to see you. Um, so, so, you know, just stiffen your spine and, and go forward and, and find some people to be your buffer zone and hang out with. Um, and then, you know, make snarky, snarky little notes to yourself and then gossip with your friends afterwards. I, that's what I would do. And good luck and hang in there. I realize this is trying to untangle the scheme, but how does a cheater come to terms that their cheating is more important than their intact family? Um, so you want me to be inside the head of a cheater going, hmm, screwing around, or my kids, which is more important. Um, 
Well, to cheaters, they think they're getting it all, right? I mean, that's the point of cake. The cake is having your affairs and your marriage. So ideally in the cheating world, you get all of it. Um, now, there are the sociopathic SOBs that just abandon, right, and just walk away from their children and go off into the sunset with their schmoopy and that's it, and those people are monsters. Um, why would you want to, you can't untangle that scheme because if you have a soul and if you have a moral mind, you can't really comprehend walking away from children and not having anything to do with them for a piece of ass. That You're just not made that way. Don't even try to go there. Um, you know, I, I don't think they, they think this is more important than that. I, I, I think cheaters People who behave this way are very impulsive, and they really don't think past, I want this, and I want it, and I'm entitled to it. And and how that impacts other people and how that's going to fall out, I, I don't think they think about it. And how do I know that? Because that's what their behavior tells us. I have read your book. I subscribe to your blog. I know that your advice is spot on, and yet I still replay what my ex did to me. Help. Um, well, how much time do you have to think, you know? You, you are going to think about it for a while. You are going to process it, but um, I don't know. You don't say what your timeline is here. Fill your life up. And, and I don't mean to be flippant, you know? It's a lot of work to, to gain a life and build a new life. But if you're really busy with your new life and you're doing everything in your power to fill your life with new people and and activities and parenting and all of that, you are eclipsing that crap. You don't, he's not gonna come into your thoughts as much because you're just too busy. So get busy, make yourself do it, force yourself to do it. And over time, it'll pay rewards and you will get to Matt. How do I get to Matt when every day is a reminder of him getting his perfect life of part-time dad, single guy, and me losing everything? Um, well, you lost him, and if he's a cheater, what did you really lose? You know, he lost a jerk. Um, he doesn't have a perfect life. He sucks, right? You, you've got a trust that he sucks problem. Um, don't, don't measure yourself against the perfect cheater. You know, you're romanticizing his life, um, when his life of part-time dad, single guy, really, is that what you want? You know, is that the kind of man you would aspire to date or marry, you know, some part-time kind of douchey guy who doesn't commit to anything? Is this someone to admire, someone to hold in esteem? I, I mean, why are you looking to him for validation, you know? Meh comes when you embrace yourself and your values and you carve out a life for yourself that is no reflection on him um, and what he did to you or how he hurt you. And it takes a long time to get there, right? But you're not going to get there if you look back and go, oh, Chris is in draft. His life is great and mine sucks. I mean, it's human, right? It's really human, but it's just going to set you back. You just got to ask yourself, what next? What do I want? What can I do? You know, and, and take the long view. It's hard, right? It's really hard. But sure, life is great when, you know, you don't, when you're this deep and you're shallow and you don't invest, right? The things that really matter play out over time, like raising your kids right, like being a good person, like investing in your family. Those aren't instant kibbles. Those aren't instant rewards. They, they pay the dividends in the long term. So invest in the people who really care about you and love you and, you know, who cares? He's a part-time douchebag. Uh, he's in your past. Will I survive losing everything that I hold precious to me? Home, friends, family, and parenting my children. Um, yeah, you will survive it, um, but it's going to be a lot different than the family, home, friends, et cetera, that you imagined you were going to have. Um, and that's a big disconnect, and that takes quite some time to get used to. So why don't we just go through them one by one, okay? Home. Um, 
your house is just a house, it's just a thing, right? Where you live is not your home. So you can have a home wherever you are and the people you love are. Um, you're just minus one fuckwit now. So it, that doesn't matter. That doesn't affect your home. You still have an intact family. You just don't have a cheater in your life. So redefine home. Friends, your real friends are the people who share your values and who stick with you through this nightmare. Um, those are your friends. If people are going Switzerland on you, if they're neutral, if they fail to understand your hostility, um, maybe you don't share values with those people and maybe you just have shared history and they're not really your friends. So unfortunately, divorce usually requires a certain culling of the social order. Um, so that person's not your friend. Um, family, I kind of want that one back under home. You still have a family. You may have lost your in-laws and that is sad, but you know, Usually in-laws follow their cheating son or daughter. That's, that's the way that breaks up and that's what divorce is. It's the breakup of families. Parenting your children is as unjust that we lose time with our children. Um, and the only answer to that is to be a sane parent. You know, show up every day and do your parenting job. You are not your child's friend. You are their parent and model resiliency and strength and gaining a life. Um, that is the best gift you can give your parent, your children, is to be a good parent, to be the same parent. Thanks. I learned that my soon-to-be ex is truly an antisocial, psychopathic narcissist. Wow. Any way to convey that to others without coming off like a bitter bitch? Um, if your ex is truly an antisocial, psychotic narcissist, you should just be happy they're your ex. What you tell other people is like the least of your problems. Your biggest problem is that they're, if you have any contact or any way this person can still be in your life. Um, who do you have to tell? I guess that's my first thing. If you've tangled with somebody that disordered, most people close to you know what's going on. Um, the people who really matter have your backs and, and don't need a lot of dramatic details. If there's, pe or there's people in your life are kind of hanging on and like the drama, um, maybe they're not the best people to have in your life. And, and maybe you're feeding into that by telling them details. You know, it's great to have support. I, I think not a lot of people can really relate sometimes with being people who are really out there. Um, so it's good to take it to a therapist. It's good to take it to a support group. Um, where other people have had those kind of experiences and, and you're believed and you're validated. And, and when you get that kind of validation, then you don't really need to like be emotionally sloppy with other people. You know, in the early days, it's hard not to be emotionally sloppy because it's just so God awful. But if this person's your ex, like you've had some time to process. And um, yeah, anonymous online support groups are the way it's, you know, the place to work that stuff out. Um, you don't control what other people think of you. If they think you're a bitter bitch, that's their problem. Um, it, you know, speak your truth, but you don't have to tell everybody every detail of your story. You know, just the ones who matter, the people who care, but not the general riffraff. That's my advice. How do you control the sick at your stomach reaction when you see an email from your ex? Well, fortunately for me, I don't see emails from my exes anymore, um, but I, I totally understand the feeling. Um, so I would say it's probably early days if you're still feeling sick at the sight of an email from them. It, it's traumatic. You're still processing who this person really is. Um, there's lots of different ways to, to manage this. The first is just email folders and filters and just make it go to a separate folder. And maybe you get a trusted friend to read it before you read it, you know, someone with a good sense of humor who can kind of make fun of all their stupid demands or their insults or their come-ons or whatever it is they're writing to you about. The other thing is if you have deep enough pockets is if you're going through a divorce and you're getting an email um, if, from your ex, presumably maybe still in the process, they could go to your lawyer. You know, that's why you pay them. They, they don't feel emotional about it and then you can just boil it down to business. If it's just business, it, it can be discussed. Your lawyer can deal with it, or you can just respond, you know, I don't have your collection of antique fountain pens, you know, or Taylor will be ready for her pickup at 5 p.m., you know, whatever the scheduling issue is. 
Um, everything else, all the emotional stuff, just leave it out. So you just have to put your analytical brain in there and, um, and, and not give this person your power. It's really easy to say. It's really hard to do, but that's what it boils down to. Don't give them kibbles of centrality. Don't give them their power. Don't allow them to upset you. You know, take back your power and, and don't be cowed. You know, it's just an email from a jerk who cheated on you. But do you or did you have a hard time blogging and writing with your real name about being cheated on? Um, yes and no. I mean, I, I came up with a pen name, Chump Lady, and I think my first maybe two or three columns were written as Chump Lady. I'm just still got my Chump Lady. Um, but if you go into the about, it says Tracy Shorn. Um, and, and no, not really. I mean, I got over it pretty quickly. Uh, about three months after I started the blog, I was invited to submit or something to Huffington Post, and, and so I did, and obviously I can't submit it as Chump Lady, or that would be really lame. Um, you know, and I, I'm, I'm proud of my writing. I'm proud of the success of my blog, and, and now I'm the author of a book, and, you know, why shouldn't it have my name? Um, and it is weird to go through life, especially if you Google me, because now I have a very Googleable name, um, turning up a chump, you know, it, it was really a very small period of my life. I, you know, I was, I was, you know, married six months when this happened to me. So, um, should I be mortified? <laughs> He's the freak. Um, what's mortifying are the chumpy, stupid things I did, you know, for several months after discovery, but they're very human. And I think, I think the only way we're going to change the conversation is if we talk about it um, and name things. And, you know, I guess it begins with naming myself, Tracy Shorn. I'm a chump or I was a chump recovering. Hi there. Welcome to my AMA. Um, I've answered a couple questions. I'm going to ask a few more here um, or answer them. How do I stop talking about my lying, serial, cheating ex? I'm still so angry that he fooled me for so long but I want it out of my thoughts. So I, you didn't say how long it's been. Um, you say he's an ex, so that's a good thing. So I'm assuming it's been a while. Yeah, this, this one is just, a, you gotta tough it out, man. It's, you know, it's a mental battle. It, it's something traumatic that happened to you. You're gonna process it and think it and second guess yourself um, or stay angry about it. But, you know, it's finite. You got to work it out. You can have analysis paralysis. You can think about it too much. I call that untangling the skein of suck up business. And I talk about that in the book and on the blog. Um, you know, try to be angry that he fooled you. You want him out of your thoughts. That's on you. You, you know, you thinking about him doesn't do anything to him. You know, you got to focus on building your, your new life and, and presumably he won't be in your thoughts if he's not in your life. You know, maintain no contact. If you have to co-parent with him, that's tougher. Um, but even that can be managed with, you know, software <laughs> and boundaries and learning to write business-like terse short emails. Um, you know, it takes time. It takes time and it's a process and you get better at it. And, and just, you know, hang in there. Oh. Do you ever anonymously post on reconciliation sites to try to save newbies from living the nightmare? Um, no, I don't. Um, you know, early on, I, I used to post as myself. You know, before I became Chump Lady, I belonged to other infidelity boards, um, and I certainly tried in my pre-Chump Lady way to get people to run away. Um, but no, I, I'm so busy <laughs> like running a, a blog, I, I really don't have time to be on other blogs now, sadly, or other boards, sadly. Um, and I certainly don't do it anonymously. You know, if I, if I am gonna get out there, I, I give the name of my blog. And I got pretty good SEO, people find me if you Google. If, but you have to be open to the message, right? A lot of people try reconciliation and, and they're not there yet. So 